Welcome to Club Book with Elizabeth Acevedo. My name is Shannon Gibney, and I am a Minneapolis-based writer and professor. Before I introduce tonight's guest properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that is bringing her to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Hennepin County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to Family Lore will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. Have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're close to the area. One final housekeeping note. Also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. MELSA would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program, and it's quick and easy. And now for our featured event. Elizabeth Acevedo is a Dominican American author and spoken word artist. She's best known to many for her 2018 young adult novel in verse, The Poet X, which won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature and the prestigious Carnegie Medal. Acevedo's follow-up uh, with The Fire on High and Clap When You Land solidified Acevedo's standing as one of the foremost YA writers of her generation. She also holds distinction as the Young People's Poet Laureate for 2022-2023, a National Poetry Slam champion, and a frequent TED Talk presenter. Family Lore, the author's first novel for adults, hit shelves in August. Flor Marte has a gift. She can predict to the day when someone will die. When she asks her family to schedule a wake, a wake without a death, Flor's three sisters are left to wonder if the clairvoyant has seen her own death or is driven by other motives. Spanning the three days prior to this most unusual family gathering, Family Lore traces the lives and uncovers the long-held secrets of all four Marte sisters. Um, so after a short uh, talk reading by our guest and some initial questions from me, we'll have time for audience Q&A. Um, and you can simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook and our tech manager will route them to me. Um, if you'd like, you can also send a message to Club Book through Facebook Messenger or email, where we're at clubbookmn at gmail.com. So with that, I will take a little break here and let Elizabeth take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Good evening, folks. I am delighted to be able to spend this evening with you all to talk about my work, to be in conversation with Shannon. Um, I know there are many things you could be doing on a Thursday night, and I appreciate you spending it um, with me talking about books and stories. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, about my writing process, and then I will read um, a couple excerpts uh, so that folks who may be aren't familiar with my voice or with um, the work, if you haven't read it yet, we'll get some type of familiarity before we jump into some of the nitty gritty stories, yeah? So I was born and raised in New York City. Both my parents are from the Dominican Republic and they emigrated here uh, in the late 1970s. I see myself as having been a storyteller even as a child. I remember being five years old and not yet having um, an acquisition of, of my letters and of writing and being so upset because there was so much I wanted to remember. And I knew that if I could write it down, then I would be able to go back to it. So even as a child, this desire to concretize my thoughts and my ideas and the little musings and mostly songs, right? I would make up these little songs and really want to remember them. Um, and not being able to. And so writing has always been this kind of um, place that can hold where what I'm thinking and feeling and, and make it real and make it something that I can go back to that I won't lose, this idea of losing, right? I 
quickly turned songwriting as a child into hip hop. I wanted to be a rapper. Um, and I think a lot of my work is informed by that desire, by being heavy into hip hop and beats and music and um, rap and the, the the melodies, right? The the cadences. And so even my prose, I'm I'm editing and I'm I'm writing with my ear, right? I, I'm thinking about sound pretty much at all times. It's it's one of the main layers of my writing. I went from hip hop, I found poetry slams when I was in high school. I had this amazing teacher named Abby Lublin who started a poetry club called the Live Poet Society. And we would meet once a week. And there I, I realized all these other teenagers were also writing um, in different forms and approaching metaphor differently and imagery differently. And it opened up what I thought writing could be. I had um, really leaned on, on hip hop in a, a very tight form, right? Anyone who knows rap, you know, it's 16 lines for one verse, you get three verses, two courses, typically, right? And that was my form. And having it open up into poetry can be so many things, but also poetry can be performed. And there was something really powerful about someone who had a lot of insecurities about my body, who both wanted to be seen and was horrified by being looked at, to have that moment where I claimed three minutes on a stage where I said, you know, of my own volition and through my own agency, I believe I have something to say and I want you to stop and, and listen. Like there's something really powerful, I think, about a teenager um, taking up that kind of space. And it it changed how I thought of myself. It changed how I thought of what my role in society could be, what I could have to offer, um, the interconnectedness of myself and other poets and other writers, but also myself and audiences. And I think that those were some of my earliest workshops were being on a stage, trying out a poem, um, getting a score that wasn't great and realizing, okay, something didn't connect or, you know, or maybe I'm doing something and it's just too different, right? Like I had to really think critically about what my work was doing and, and how to advance, um, you know, to move forward. I became an English teacher right after college. I studied performing arts. I've made up my own major, which was pretty much like, how do I create a one woman show where I can perform poetry, right? My life was geared around trying to make my poems um, the way that I lived. I, I wanted to, to, to live a life of language. And I, I put everything I could in that direction. But it was, you know, 2009 and there wasn't these great options in the middle of the Great Recession and um, to go around the world saying poems. So I became an English teacher uh, because it felt like I could still connect. I could talk about reading, which I loved. I could talk about language and writing. Um, and I taught in Prince George's County, Maryland. I taught eighth grade English language arts. And it was an amazing time. I, I didn't write. I'm not going to lie to you, right? Like, it was really hard to put my creativity into anything but lesson planning and grading and wallowing in how terrible of a teacher I was. And so it wasn't a time where I was making, but it was a time where I was entrenched in, in young people's um, language and headspace and, and deep, big feelings and the, the tough things that were going on in their lives that they would admit and the things they wouldn't say that, you know, you you could infer um, and the ways they were struggling with reading and, and how do I use literature to maybe connect or as a bomb or as a a way to 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 offer something for this young person to hold on to, I think was my big goal. I want you to be a really strong reader. And I think the way I can make you a strong reader is by giving you things that you love to read and then giving you more things that you will love to read, right? And so I that was my kind of ethos as a teacher. But you have to imagine in this time, you know, this was right before Walter D. Myers wrote his seminal essay in 2014 about the lack of diversity in literature, but it had been brewing for years that there just weren't enough books um, for the kinds of young people that I taught. And, and it, it hit me firsthand when I had a young person pretty much tell me like, yeah, I'm not into reading. None of these books are about us. They don't, they don't sound like us. They're not in the neighborhoods where we're from. 
And although I was, you know, had been a poet and I recited poetry to my young people all the time, it was this moment where I realized they can't take it with them. It's not a tangible thing. They can't hold my poems. If I'm not in the room, if my body's not in the room, then they, they're bereft, right? From, from the kind of language I want them to have. And so it, it felt like such a baton in that moment where it's like, what insecurity have I had that I don't think I could write a book? And what is it that I'm afraid of? And why am I afraid of, of a novel or of prose or of, of grammar, of, of all these things? Maybe I have something to offer in this form. And it was a challenge that um, I wasn't successful at at first. I started writing The Poet X back in 2012. Um, it did not get acquired until 2016. It wasn't published until 2018. And so it took a lot of time and I wrote a lot of things in between. I left teaching, I got my master's in creative writing um, and I, I kind of just continued this life of pursuing as much language and literature as I could, but there was this new kind of battery in my back, right? Where I was really thinking about um, what can I offer to, you know, American letters that, that maybe isn't here and how can I use all of these experiences and this musicality and what I know and my ear for, for the young people's speech and what can I do with it, right? And, and from there, I, you know, put the Poet X together and, and then many other books. And I, at that point, once I finished the Poet X, I knew that there would be many other novels. I've never been the kind of writer where it was like, oh, I'm one and done, or maybe I'll have another book. I, I am lucky that there's always many, many stories, right? It's really about time and patience, but it's not a lack of of having the thing to write. And so I, I hope to write many more stories even after um, my last book. So I, I wanna read from the Poet X so that folks who don't know it kind of get a, a sense of, of my project. Um, the Poet X is the story of Xiomara Batista, who is a 15 year old Dominican American growing up in New York City. And um, she discovers poetry slams at school. She's also being raised in a really strict religious household where um, she is she is being taught to not only be afraid of her voice, but to be afraid of how she takes up space. I am unhideable taller than even my father, with what mommy has always said was a little too much body for such a young girl. I am the baby fat that settled into D cups and swinging hips so that the boys who called me whale in middle school now ask me to send them pictures of myself in a thong. The other girls call me conceited, ho, thought, fast. When your body takes up more room than your voice, you are always the target of well-aimed rumors which is why I let my knuckles talk for me, which is why I learned to shrug when my name was replaced by insults. I have forced my skin just as thick as I am. Mira muchacha is mommy's favorite way to start a sentence. And I know I've already done something wrong when she hits me with that. Look, girl, this time is mira muchacha. Marina from across the street told me you were on the stoop again, talking to los vendedores. Like usual, I bite my tongue and don't correct her because I hadn't been talking to the drug dealers. They'd been talking to me. But she said she doesn't want any conversation between me and those boys or any boys at all. And she better not hear about me hanging out like a wet shirt on a clothesline, just waiting to be worn or she would go ahead and be the one to wring my neck. Oiste, she asks, but walks away before I can answer. Sometimes I want to tell her the only person in this house who isn't heard is me. I'm the only one in the family without a biblical name. Shit, Siomara isn't even Dominican. I know because I Googled it. It means one who is ready for war. And truth be told, that description is about right. Because I even tried to come into the world in a fighting stance. Feet first. Had to be cut out of mommy after she'd given birth to my twin brother, Xavier, just fine. And my name labors out of some people's mouths in that same awkward and painful way until I have to slowly say, Si Omara. 
I've learned not to flinch the first day of school as teachers get stuck stupid trying to figure it out. Mommy says she thought it was a saint's name, gave me this gift of battle, and now curses how well I live up to it. My parents probably wanted a girl who would sit in the pews wearing pretty florals and a soft smile. They got combat boots and a mouth silent until it's sharp as an island machete. Pero tú no eres fácil is a phrase I've heard my whole life. When I come home with my knuckles scraped up, pero tú no eres fácil. When I don't wash the dishes quickly enough or I forget to scrub the tub, pero tú no eres fácil. Sometimes it's a good thing when I do well on an exam or the rare time I get an award. Oh, oh, pero tú no eres fácil. When my mother's pregnancy was difficult and it was all because of me, because I was turned around and they thought that I would die or worse, that I would kill her. So they held a prayer circle at church and even Father Sean showed up at the emergency room. Father Sean who held my mother's hand as she labored me into the world and Papi paced behind the doctor who said this was the most difficult birth she had ever been a part of. But instead of dying, I came out wailing waving my tiny fist. And the first thing Papi said, the first words I ever heard, pero tú no eres fácil, you sure ain't an easy one. And so I think you can hear a little bit of, of maybe what was happening there and um, how I was chasing this momentum, this kind of voice, this character, their Spanish, their slang. I, I really um, tried to perfect my ear for how folks talk. A dialogue is, is really important to me and, and getting that accurate is really important to me. And I would say that Family Lore, which is my latest novel, it's my first novel for uh, specifically for adult readers, although right, adults are, are welcome to read my YA stories. Um, it's just that I imagine that this book might be harder for young people. And so that's the distinction of an adult book versus a YA book, because sometimes people are like, you know, I, I'm an adult and I read your YA and I'm like, no, totally you should. <laughs> I just, if you're 13, you probably should hang off reading family lore or or make sure you're reading it with an adult. So family lore is a story that I began writing in 2019, although I had had um, little ideas for it um, over the years, right? And so I would get an idea like, oh, I really want to write about my mother and her sisters. My mom is one of nine sisters, um, one of 15 total. She has six brothers. And so I grew up with this massive extended family and watching their dynamic and interactions and um, always found so interesting how um, they're in community with each other. And, and so I knew I wanted to write about the women because they, they, they bicker in interesting ways. They make up in interesting ways. They have cliques that, you know, they beef with each other. I'm like, this is amazing. Like you're, you're just a study in, <laughs> in, um, in, in sisterhood. Yeah. And so I, I had that in the back of my mind. And then I watched this documentary on living wakes. And I remember thinking, you know, what kind of person would throw themselves awake while they're alive and what would be the circumstances around them? What would their family think? Especially if they're Dominican, which is such a Catholic nation, but also a very superstitious nation um, and people, what, what would be at play there? How would they handle that? And so this book slowly began forming itself long before I ever sat down to write. And so I'm gonna read a really quick excerpt so that we can jump into the conversation with Shannon and then the Q and A, but I want you to also have a ear for what my prose sounds like and what my register for for a different audience kind of sounds like. And also, you know, a book that comes out in 2023 versus 2018, the, the kinds of ways I'm trying to push um, where my writing is and is going. Yes, of course. It begins with the body for me. I have sometimes felt like an occupant in this flesh something that is being hosted. Until I had my first love, although looking back, those were a youngster's emotions. I truly became human when I became pregnant with you. Nothing, not even making love, had ever arrived me to my own body like growing another person. It was primal, physical, the sensations that became new to me. 
I would wake up and brush my teeth, and the moment the toothbrush touched my tongue, I would begin to gag, a visceral shock from the dream world to the body. You know me, Ona. I struggle with decisions sometimes. But from the moment I knew I was carrying you, the most animal of choices became easy. What do I want to eat? No, not that, not that, yes, this. I would stand at my station at the button factory and hunger, urinating, resting, were sensations as loud as the machines whirring around me. The cues were urgent, unignorable. I have never known so cre clearly what I wanted and needed at almost all times. I remember one day walking through Morningside Park. You know that patch by 110th Street where the baseball fields are? They had just mowed it, the tractor not yet having rolled off the field. And I swear to you, I wanted to drop to my knees. The grass smelled alive, the milk of each cut blade sweetening the air. And I felt like my nose picked up every single drop of dew. I'd known beautiful fields and admired trees and birds, but with the second heartbeat in my body, my senses were newly electrified. You grounded me here with both feet on both knees, stooped on all floors, heaving to bring you forth. I have known death since before I was born, but I had not truly known life until I gave it to you. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm excited to chat about these books. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I love, um, you know, not all writers, sadly, are great readers, <laughs> honestly. Um, and so it's just wonderful to have somebody who is um, talented in both. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, um, because it, it, you know, it gives the, the words on the page a different heft, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And I, I loved also hearing about, um, you know your your process of of listening as well for those voices because in many ways for me family lore is a book about voices right um and so i guess um you know yeah i have so many questions for you and we're not going to get to all of them i just have to i just have to embrace that fact i'm doing that now um but the but but the you know the the section that you just read sort of inspired a question in me um that I think was formulating as I was reading the novel. I mean, this is a very, um, this is a novel that is really grounded in the body. And mm -hmm. I would say really in the female body in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, as a woman of a certain age, um, you know, uh, 48, um, you know, we don't necessarily get to see, I mean, I, I feel like, even in YA, uh, there's more talk about the body changing, how woman's body changes, and um, menstruation, and then even there's more talk. I, I felt, you know, when I my, myself was having kids, and you know, more uh, I had more stories about um, from the dominant culture about pregnancy yeah. and mm -hmm. raising kids, but we just we don't get a lot about women, I would say, in their 40s and beyond, you know, um, and so I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. um, and that women, like, we're not dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, we have, we, 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 we have, you know, our, our bodies are very much alive. And yeah. so I just wondered if you could maybe talk about, you know, People write for all different kinds of reasons. Um, but I mean, did you, was that something that you set out to do? Was that intentional? Or was it really like, this is how these voices came to you? Um, I would say that there was intent in getting down the kinds of stories that I had heard from the women in my family around their bodies and around the changes that they were going through that I did not hear otherwise. I didn't really have, like I knew about menopause very, very young because my mom and her friends and, and my aunts were always talking about their hot flashes and la, 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 la menopausa, la menopausa. Like it was like, and I didn't even know. And I'm like, what is this menopausa thing? It makes you so hot. Why are they so <laughs> hot, right? And so then later when you realize like, oh, it's this, it's this, it's, it's the, the 
this other stage, like your menstruation is a stage. This is like, there are many stages, um, but I hadn't seen it in books. And I think even TV and movies, you know, I think there's a way that um, it's how misogyny plays out, right? Where it's like women um, beyond childbearing years are, are just for pasture. You're put out, you're supposed to be quiet in the corner. You're the granny knitting. And it's like, you're not, what about your desires? What about your desires despite the fact your body's changing? What about your desire because your body's changing? What about, um, I, I don't know. It, it felt like a huge disservice because I knew the conversations we're having. It's just why are they ha being had behind these kinds of closed doors? Why is there shame around how these conversations are, are being written about? Um, and I think for me, I'm always searching for where is the silence and yeah. where um, where is it going to require a kind of bravery or a, or a kind of exploration that I haven't seen in order to kind of bust open whatever that that door is that's saying, no, that stays back behind there. You know, and I think my mom would I don't know what her reaction would be. It's coming out in Spanish in a couple of weeks. So I guess I will know um, <laughs> as to just how corporal this book yes, is. That, how, yes, that is the perfect word for it. That yeah. is exactly Thing. Well, I, I'm gonna. I stole it from Imani Perry, who had a conversation with it. She's like, "This is a really corporal book," and I'm like, "Yes." Yeah. So I, I, I won't take credit, but that description felt so right. I'm like, "Yes." For me, there is so much about how we are taught not to listen to the body, specifically as women, mm -hmm. that that this book centers entirely around the all the magic is located in the body in order for them to fully understand their magic they kind of have to know where it is and be able to hear it all of the ways that they interact with other people there's it's it's visceral um and i think that it, it is about this knowledge and this return to the ways we're taught to shut down our hunger cues and our our desires and um and our pain and our hurt and be strong right and and not allow for for the nuance there and and it all i think comes back to just the meat right to the flesh and so the, the book is all about that and 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 yeah i'm writing about 70 year old women so like their knees ache but they're still dancing and they and they they have you know gone through different stages and um i wanted to chronicle it yeah, no, and I mean, there were times in this book, I don't know, I'm not going to assume that everybody in the audience has read it. I mean, I just laughed out loud. Like, it was like so refreshing because it was just like, yeah, I mean, we were chatting before at like the alpha vagina. Like, I was like, wow, this is like a whole vibe. This is this, like, this is a whole thing, right? And I was just like, okay, what does that mean? And I kept reading. And, and you know, it's like this thing where you just sort of like, you get further down into the rabbit hole and it starts to make sense, right? Um, so I just appreciated um, the kind of wildness, I guess, yeah. of the novel, like, which is a form, I mean, it, it, Louise Erger called it, you know, the superior form, you know? I mean, you can, you can kind of do anything in a novel if you can do it, <laughs> and that, you yeah. know, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I just also wanted to talk to you about the process of, of writing um, a novel that's so vast. I mean, so many different voices, so many different characters. Um, you know, do, do you sort of write it, you know, structurally also just, was this, I, I'm assuming it's probably not being right myself. I know how things go. It's probably not the, 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 the structure that first came to you, um, right. but you know, how did you did you did you write in one voice uh, for a while? And then there's also the sort of indented voices, right, which are sort of commenting on yeah. what the central voice is saying. Yeah. Um, I'm just what was so what was your process? Uh, I, I love what you just said about, you know, you can do anything if a novel if you can do it, because I think that's almost always what I feel when I'm writing a book. It's like this book might be so good if I can pull it off, right? right. Like it's that <laughs> if, if I can translate here to here, you know, and then revise it tight, like I might be able to get there, but this book more than any other book, because it is six central characters, it spans time, it jumps in times. You know, I, I went in knowing 
I'm going to be asking the reader to do a lot of work okay. and I'm going to, I'm going to have to be comfortable with that. And my readers are going to have to be comfortable with that, that this isn't a book that's going to wash over you. It's not a, a, I think, I think it requires work to keep the characters together, to be okay with, with how time is happening with the way that language slides into language and, and, and there aren't always cues you know, I mean, there are passages where an entire character speaks and then they say, no, I didn't say that. Like, of course, I didn't <laughs> say that. No one says that out loud. Right. And then you're like, oh, I as a reader, you have to now. Oh, OK, I, <laughs> right. the reality. Reintegrate. Is, oh, yes, yeah. yes. Perfect. Reintegrate. Right. And so I, I knew that I wanted to be playful and I wanted to experiment. Um, I don't plot. And so it makes writing this kind of book really hard because I'm not always sure how things are going to pan out. Um, and I just kind of trust my revisor self to be able to find the threads that the creative self is just being wild and trying things. And then, you know, that's a job for the person who's a little bit more of a strickler to, to, to get together a stickler. Um, and so I that was kind of how it played. I mean, I had I had the magic early on and I knew what each character's magic was. So that grounded the character that gave them a sense of what they would be capable of, of what their weaknesses were, where their strengths were. I, I had a sense of um, who loved each character and love is a big question in the book. How did you learn to love? How, how, how do you practice love? Um, and so you'll see that there are relationships where nieces and aunts maybe are closer than mothers than like the mother and daughter, like where does love move and how does it move and how do you feel known it felt like a big part of the book so I knew these these were the central the central wonderings. Um, and then it was kind of like oh and the stories are the answers it I wrote the whole thing and then realized oh Ona who is my narrator is um, doing interviews. She's conducting interviews with her family. This is a, a book about oral storytelling. It's a book about the things we hear and how we hear them and the contradictions of you hear a story from one aunt and then the other one is like, that's not how it happens, <laughs> right? And you have to be like, uh, I guess I just have to reconcile with the fact that there is no like ensemble truth telling. There is just each individual's truth that I have to you know, make peace with that I, I won't have all the pieces because they've been telling these stories for decades and they're going to tell it with a little bit of spice that they want to make it showcase them how they want. And so the book began to take shape. So it's a book within a book, right? You have the the living wake and that's the central conceit that invites people in and why these women are reflective in that particular way. But then you realize, oh, there's this other thing. There's this question of legacy and of what gets lost when a woman who has held the archive in her body is gone, mm -hmm. right? And 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 what does it mean to try to archive the stories? Mm -hmm. So um, the book had a lot of shapes. There were, you know, Ona, who is the, the narrator, one of the central characters is an anthropologist. At one point there were abstracts all throughout the book. There was bits of research. I love windows. I love different kinds of ways to welcome a reader in. To, to show a different side. That's why you get the asides. Those used to be abstracts. And I, I realized, oh, I want them more, more involved. I want them to be disruptions. I want you to know um, when you're reading a character, maybe the reader is like, this is so awful. How could they do that? And then this character comes in and it's like, let me contextualize time and place and expectations so that you have just this other other thing that is buffering or are um, offering something new to what you're understanding. And so having kind of an anthropologist that interrupts the story throughout, let me um, situate the characters in different ways and offer humor, right? Like there are moments that she's just a smart ass. And so she can lighten up a mood by interrupting the, the story or, or make something somber by, by saying, yeah, this sounds all funny games, but like, it wasn't that that simple. And so um, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. And it, it the book is vast, like you said, and um, it was unwieldy. And I just I did my best to um, let it be a, a book that felt really free. And um, and that that did something I had never done, which I think every single book I write, I, I just want to write something new and different and and see how far um you know, I can flex. 
that, I mean, that really was, you know, because I've read the poet acts, I've read Clap When You Land. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was sort of like a, every book you open, it's, you know, it's like meeting a new person, right? It's like totally different, right? And I was like, you know, 10 pages and I was like, oh, this book is wild. <laughs> <laughs> like, like in the best way possible. Like I did not know what was going to happen next. And um, the best and, compliment. And, Thank you. Yeah, no. So I really appreciated that. Um, I did. Um, so I guess I want to ask then also, um, you know, getting into moving, if you would say, you know, you're um, moving from, you know, writing for teenagers and middle grade to um, adult. And, you, you know, you sort of touch on this in your author's note a little bit, right? That, you mm -hmm. know, you, you had, I think it was a meeting with your cousin. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so the story sort of, and I know how this is too, right? Like stuff just latches onto you, yeah, right? Yes, this yes. idea that you you decide what you're gonna write. It's right, really no. funny to me. Like, it's like, no, this stuff just, it's just, mm -hmm, and then you gotta, mm -hmm. it's like, you gotta work through it and exercise it. Um, and so, but I, I mean, the fact still remains that, you know, let's say the Poet X and Clap When You Land are novels in verse, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, The Fire and High is not, um, but, um, you know, and, the, and that those are more for younger audiences. Um, and so, um, and, and this book, um, you know, whoever reads it, reads it, I guess, but, you know, yeah. um, it, it, it is ostensibly uh, for an adult literary audience. Mm -hmm, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, any of, any of the, the, the different concerns from genre to genre, the same concerns, um, your process also. Um, I've never written a novel in verse. I think I would be eminently challenged by that. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, what does yeah. that look like versus something like this? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I appreciate the question and um, how well versed you are in my work. <laughs> Thank you for reading my stuff. <laughs> That's great. It's just reader. I love. Yeah. So yeah. I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, um, I think I, I mentioned this a little bit. So I started writing the poet X and realized I didn't know how to write a novel. Right. I knew how to write individual poems. A novel is a completely different project and a novel in verse. How do you get. 300 poems or or lyrical text to tell a story to create a, a, a human is you know essentially a, a family and so there were just rules that I had to make for myself but it it was a long a long process and I did um before I completed the poetics I think I did 40 pages I realized I don't I don't know how to do this I like I need to be stronger before I can tackle this thing. And so I did National Novel Writing Month and that's when I wrote with the fire on high. And it was, well, maybe if I if I just do prose and kind of tell a story straight out. Um, but you could tell even with the fire on high, it's it's very short prose, they're almost like prose poems held throughout, right? Um, I started Clap When You Land. I started a lot of different things. I wrote a fantasy novel that was awful. It will never see the light of day. <laughs> and then I went back to the Poet X and when I was in it, I just, I remember I would tell my husband all the times, I just can't see it. I don't know how to hold this much text. Yeah, I get that it. That interiority. Yeah. And like, I don't know, did the character go to school this week? Like, I don't know. It's been 40 <laughs> pages of like feelings. And so um, I think what that book taught me though, is, you know, that is always the process of the book. It's, right, you can't right. see it, you can't hold it, yep. you keep going, and then the reader uh, in you steps in once it's done and says, oh, no, no, not that, yes, this. When you're in it, when you're making, for me, um, I just have to generate. And, and, you know, and, and in general, I'm a spare writer. My first drafts are very slim because I'm just trying to get the, the thing down. Mm -hmm. And then I come in and I see the gaps or or there's no body or they haven't used a bathroom like people use bathrooms like, <laughs> we need a bathroom scene in every book right <laughs> remind you know there's they're human and so family lore in some ways was wild and and because it had so much going on I think would have been really scary at, at another point in my career but I'm just so familiar with the sense of yeah every book is hard 
Yeah. And that's a good thing. Every book should be harder than the last book to write. Every book, I should be trying something I haven't done before. And I have to go write and practice other things in order to get the muscle up to come back. Mm -hmm. And I think because that's the approach um, that that's comfortable, right? That that difficulty is, is comfortable for me. Um, but there were, you know, there are questions I'm definitely asking that are similar, mothers and daughters, um, family, what do we do with the secrets that family keep? Um, culture, how do we live within a culture? How do we perform Dominicanness? Is there a right way to perform that? Is, you know, how do we generationally say I need to bring the my the older generation into a new or introduce a new way of thinking, maybe? Um, and I also need to know when my elders are are saying something I haven't been able to hear. And so a lot of those questions. Um, we're in family lore, but I would say it's, I mean, it's clearly spicier. I got to play with like how sex complicates and simplifies with um, how relationships that are, are grounded in, in hard soil, right? That in, in, in unforgiving soil, what that can do to us. And I think that those are questions that I might touch on in my YA, but but not in the way I delved in here. So it really was a question of register more than anything. I got to play with language too. I mean, when I'm writing YA, I have to think, you know, would a young person know this word? And having been a school teacher, I know, right, like if, if there's more than three words on a page that a kid doesn't know, that book is going to be too high level for them. Um, or in general, that was the rule of thumb, right? And so I'm usually mindful of vocabulary, enough to push the average 13, 14, 15 year old, but not so much that like they don't feel welcomed on the page. With this book, I'm like, bruh, adults got dictionaries. You better figure it out. Like that's I mean, not my business. Like whole lines. I love it. There's like whole lines of Spanish and Spanglish and like, and you, it's like, I don't always know exactly what the character is saying, but I know what they're saying. You know that's what I mean? It. That's, that's it. That's it. That's so it. And it's I, like, I yeah. love that. And I just trusted it, like, you know, y'all are grown, y'all will figure it out, or you won't, and that's okay, you know, like, the, that, so that was different with the adult book, and I went in knowing, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just uh, see how wild I can make this world, um, and I, I think a lot of readers will, will be delighted by it, and some readers will be frustrated by it, and, like, you're welcome, you felt something. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly, right. And um, we're going to get to, we, we got some lovely um, okay. questions from readers. So we're going to get to those. I have my my last kind of personal, um, I'm going to try and formulate this into a question. Um, but the, I just feel like there's like a, a soliloquy in the book uh, about, or a, a, I don't know what it is, the manifesto, a diatribe, something about um, how food systems in a culture and a family get uh, transformed from generation to generation um, and what constitutes, uh, as you said, like true Dominicanness, like through mm -hmm. food. Um, and so is it Yadi who is uh, a yeah. vegan mm -hmm. and um, her journey, mm -hmm. right? Like insisting that, um, no, I'm I'm going to be Dominican and also be mm -hmm. vegan. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she finds sort of an unlikely ally in Matilda. Yeah. Um, you know, with that. And so um yeah, with that, I mean, I just uh, that fascinates. I mean, I'm always looking also as a reader for things that I just haven't really necessarily seen before in this particular way um in a novel. Um, and so, um, again, it's kind of a similar question as I asked before, but I mean, was this something that like, you were just like, oh, now's my chance. Yadi's going yeah. to, you know, like have her say in this, or was that something that just sort of, um, um, came to you? And it's just not something like, I just feel like a lot of these narratives sort of about, uh, a family that's like not, not like from the dominant culture, not white culture. It's like food is like so central, yeah, right? Yeah but it doesn't ever really get critiqued in the way that I feel like you're critiquing it and in terms of like the nuances yeah, of it and yeah. the power dynamics. 
no yeah. yeah I appreciate that I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm very verbal so I'm gonna try to be quick so that <laughs> we get to these but I think you you know with the fire on high I started writing about food and all my characters eat right there's always food mentioned in the books I'm, so I'm really into eating characters stuff. eating yeah <laughs> young women should eat they should see people eating on the page that's important <laughs> to me they you know so I I do that often but with um with the fire on high you know you have this character who isn't connected to um, her mother's side of the family except through recipes and has to kind of reinvent how she imagines um, culture playing into what these foods would be has to really believe I am connected to an ancestral thing that although it may not be present um, is present right and I think with that book I already started playing with food as a way to communicate food as a kind of magic food as a way to be in conversation with people who are gone um and I would say that family lore in general is deeply about like ancestor worship and about the the generations we don't know and the things they gave us and what we carry and so Yadira is an interesting character because you see someone who um her relationship to lemons changes or to limes changes <laughs> because her that. grandmother right so her yeah. grandmother dies and so she's surprising. like surprising Oh my God. <laughs> Obsessed with limes yep. um, and uses it in everything now. And, and it's her way of saying, no, my grandmother is here. Anytime I cook, my grandmother is with me and I bring her in with me. Right. But but her relationship to meat is not, it changes, but then doesn't know like that her mother meat is such a source of pride. I can feed you pro, like this thing that I starved for, that I wanted to have. Dominicans have, we say the Dominican flag, la bandera is um, rice, beans and meat. That's what we say is the actual flag. And so meat is an integral part of how we think of ourselves. But historically, ancestrally, the Taino Indians didn't use a lot of meat. They they were, they had a lot of um, root vegetables that they used. They had a lot of different ways that they cultivated the land to feed them. And so there is also then this connection of what is Dominican? What are the first people of this land? How did they cook? And so I do want to flip on its head um, the relationships, the choices we make around food because of conversations we had and because of conversations we haven't had. Mm. Um, and so that that was one of the big questions around around food and, and how we bring people through our cooking with us. That's beautiful. I wish we could just that. talk about that because I, I have I so many more I thoughts. Could go off. Oh my God, I could go off. I'm like, oh, no God. one asks me about food, but like, It was yes. fascinating to me. And then I was so hungry. Like the part where like, you know, you were talking, I don't even like coconut, okay? I don't like coconut. And the part where, you know, the, the line was out the door for Yadi's like coconut limes green smoothie. I was like, that sounds so damn good. <laughs> it just... And again, I don't even like coconut. Oh, man. So, I yeah, it. you. I just feel like there's so much there. All right, let's get to um, at least some of the questions here. Um, okay. uh, okay. Um, and, you know, you and I are both, you know, I mean, you could say verbose. You could also say like we give very detailed uh, questions and answers. We could also yes. say that we're very generous with they our very answers. Generous. Yes. <laughs> I love it. So we've been through a lot of this stuff. Um, so, um, okay, here's a good one. Um, I appreciate authors' notes and a glimpse inside the writer's head they offer. Elizabeth has led me to wonder. Did anything about the characters and the plot of the novel in its final form as readers experienced it surprise you along the way? I love this question because the, the author's note does say like there are many ways that this novel began and many ideas. And I think it, it leads people to think like, oh, well, she just transcribed like, <laughs> you know, all of her aunts. Right. But but I think it's like, what's the kernel of of uh, assemblage of people in each character? And then where does the book take on a life of its own? And I think the book for sure took on a life of its own um, and characters took on a life of their own. But my favorite example of the writing, you know, when writers make, we writing is thinking. And so writing will reveal things we don't know. I don't go in saying, this is what I'm going to say. I go in and I'm writing and, and halfway through, I say, oh, this is 
this is what I think. I didn't know mm. that's what I felt, right? And so the writing is a kind of discovery and delight. Um, and I remember I was writing about fibroids, which I had just had fibroid surgery. Um, I had a really complicated um recovery. I was very angry at my body, at my doctor. At, I was very mad at at, at the 85% of, of women of black descent who, who have fibroids, right? Like just at the system that they would go unnoticed for so long. I had all this anger. And I'm writing about it in this character. And at one point, you know, Ona is talking about the surgery and she's like, you know, they opened me up and they let the light in and the light touched all the parts that had, you know, lived in darkness. And I'm like, no, girl, we're mad. We're not talking about light. Like, we're not, you know. But, but the character had a, was doing something else and mm -hmm. was um, responding in a different way. And and the world that she occupied and and the perspective that she had was not my own. It was not a diary entry. Like, it started my reflecting on this thing, and then it 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 morphed. And I just that moment where I had to step back and be like, oh, this this trick thinks that she could just take the story over with her own little like <laughs> aside but but it but I think that that's the joy of oh that's right well there's another way for me to look at what I went through and I discovered it through this voice telling me but what about this like I can't I can't just borrow what happened to you I'm, it's my own thing. And so um, I think that, that that's probably my my favorite example of how I you know, was just stunned that that it happened and it was really healing. It was really kind of this moment of how to step back and and say, oh, oh, well, yeah, there, you know, I. The surgery was more than I um, than just the, the feelings of anger. Oh, there was light. And, and here is this character reminding me of that. That's a really powerful example. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, so um, here's another question. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but um, maybe some more reflection. Um, this person says, I'd also love to hear about how Miss Acevedo's approach toward poetry differs from prose. Yeah. Um, I'll talk specifically about the novels in verse because when I'm writing poetry, as yes, like if I'm writing poems or I've been working on my first collection for a very long time now, I think that's a, a whole other process, right? I'm very patient with poems. I think that poetry is about seeing, it's about um, where's the human experience in this and what are the least amount of words that I can use to to try to hone in on the wonder of why this experience is striking something in me. And that's how I approach poems. And um, it, for me, it feels less like I, I'm gonna sit down every day and write a poem. Um, and mainly that's because I'm often working on, on a novel and, and characters in a novel do not like being ghosted. Um, and if you leave them for a while, they get very upset at you and they're like, I'm not coming back, right? Like you, <laughs> you are a terrible date. Poems are like, all right, bro, whenever you're ready, here I am, like, I'm happy by myself. So I, I write poetry slowly, but the novels are, are different. Those I write um, I give myself kind of a time period, you know, I'm going to give myself three, four months and I'm I'm going to write as often as I can and, and get, you know, close to 2000 words a day until this project is finished because I can't revise something until it's done. And so I just, I put myself in a pressure cooker. Um, but verse, for me, the novel, the, you know, I usually know what a book is going to be going in. Um, and I let, you know, I know if like, this is a book, this is an Instagram caption, this is a, a poem, like the language tells me how, how big or how small, um, it needs to be, but a novel in verse for me kind of has some prerequisites. Um, it can't be a massive cast because you can only hold so many characters if you're writing something with 20, 30,000 words. Um, it can't be a book that is too heavily reliant on dialogue because dialogue looks clumsy on the page. Um, it's really hard to get a conversation on the page formatted in such a way that looks beautiful. And that's important to me. I, I want it to, the way it looks matters. And so um, it has to be a book that is about interiority, which means that the central questions have to be one where the character is really sitting 
in in something big so in the poet x what does it mean to be a young woman what does it mean to find your voice how do you push back against you know the the woman you love most and also the the person who you are most fearful of like that's big and so it, it has enough that the character can reflect clap when you land which is my other novel in verse is is all about grief and, and what do you do when you can't forgive the person who has upended your life and and you're learning all these things about them and you can't confront them with what's coming up for you right so that's also a big question um and allow those characters to really be in their heads and so you know those those are kind of the criteria prose i i'm, I'm there's more there's more that the the paragraph allows there's more that the sentence allows in terms of characters and names and um settings and so i I kind of have that ingrained system um, when I know a book is big or it's fantastical, right? Both my novels that have magic, big magic are in prose because world building around magic is requires more language. Okay, I that was long, but there, there's, but like, there's a just, mini class. Like you left us with so many amazing nuggets. <laughs> I mean, your description, what did you say? I mean, I love that description. I want to talk about an Instagram post or like on a like a yeah, yeah. a, a, a t-shirt I mean it's probably too long for a t-shirt <laughs> but you know your description of sort of like okay well when you're writing characters like they don't like it when you ghost you when you yeah. ghost them like they'll come you know you're not a good date like they, they will not come back versus the poems are just like yeah dude like whatever come back like that's okay. the, I feel like that's that's a description I've not heard before and so that's that. <laughs> That's very, it's very meaningful. Um, we, unfortunately, uh, I could probably talk to you forever. Um, I think we should about, just do it again. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, let's do it again. Um, we, we both have to get back to our beautiful children. Yes. Um, but um, it's just been such a delight uh, to talk to you uh, about your work, uh, your process, um, and, um, you know, just wishing you um, all the best as you, uh, you. continue on with all these uh, projects that I'm, I'm sure you're, you're knee deep in and uh, we'll be hearing about. And until then, um, all of us have the uh, great pleasure of uh, enjoying family lore. If you haven't picked it up, uh, do yourself a favor. Um, it's much better than cable TV um, and much spicier. Um, so definitely pick that <laughs> up um, and you will not be disappointed. Um, I am going to uh, actually close things down for us here um, at Club Book um, because this is all the time that we have for this evening. Um, and again, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for uh, being here, being a pleasure, you know, sharing your brilliance. Um, and uh, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Hennepin County Library for the part they played in bringing Elizabeth to us. Before you log off, look for the Club Book survey link, which is in the comments and will be pro uh, projected in place of my video momentarily. Uh, lastly, consider joining Club Book next Monday, November 13th for their next virtual program featuring Pulitzer Prize winner and 22nd Poet Laureate of the United States, Tracy K. Smith. Her latest project is To Free the Captives, A Plea for the American Soul, based on scholarship and the author's own experience and earnest soul searching, Smith's latest etches a portrait of where we find ourselves as a society 400 years into the American experiment, close quote, and offers a quote, blueprint for fulfilling our duties to each other and to the future, close quote. It debuted earlier this week. You can learn more about that and other upcoming events at clubbook.org. Have a great night, everyone. Yeah.